Today is a special day in many ways. It's the Feast of the Assumption, when we celebrate Mary's whole being, body and soul, being consumed by God and glorified. In last week's Vision and Viewpoint newsletter, Joan Chinister said this, Mary of the Assumption is a sign of what we can become if we are willing to let go of what we have planned for ourselves. Wow! That hit me right between the eyes, because I think you all know that this was not in my plans. Way back in 1972, on this very feast day, I entered religious life in Philadelphia in a community called the Religious of the Assumption. Filled with youthful idealism and desire, I believed that I would spend the rest of my life at that beautiful property and that I would be laid to rest in the quaint old cemetery on the grounds where I often walked and prayed. And then life happened. Like Mary, I needed to let go of my plans. Fast forward to the present moment. I'll spare you 48 years of personal history. Today is the day that I begin to serve as your prioress for the next five years because you and the Spirit have called me forth to be your leader in the service of love. I'm humbled and honored by your vote of confidence, and I am sure hoping that that special grace of the office you all talk about will kick in soon. Our God is full of surprises. Who could ever predict all the twists and turns in this journey of love? I invite each of you to take some time today to remember your first call and all that has happened since, to see how your initial yes has stretched you beyond your first dreams and how God has done great things for you. Rejoice. Love is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the rule of Benedict. In tonight's gospel, we heard, Love one another. Live on in my love, and you will have joy. A very simple yet profound command. I'm afraid we are so familiar with hearing this great com commandment of Jesus that we can become deaf to it. Yet, our yes to love has to be new each morning. Our response is a commitment to keep growing and expanding our heart. It depends on trust and is built up over the years through a history of many acts of kindness and forgiveness. Love changes us and it produces fruits of compassion, courage, inner freedom, and gratitude. Christian love is not just about being nice. It's about being honest, humble, just, and authentic. The Jesus that we follow dared to speak the truth in love to power. He confronted unjust social customs and practices. Today, I believe he's in the streets with the nonviolent protesters, fighting for the rights of refugees and women and victims of violence. He's marching to proclaim that black lives matter. All creation matters. All lives matter. This is the kind of love that makes it possible 
for 84 diverse women of all ages, backgrounds, temperaments, and opinions to live together in peace and harmony. For the God who unites us is much stronger than anything that divides us. This is also the love that Benedict describes in chapter 72, the good zeal. Many scholars see this chapter as the core and the essence of the rule. Benedict saw good zeal as love in action, a dynamic force permeating everything. Benedict calls us to a radical living of the gospel by being zealous for peace, justice, and dignity for all. We are to see Christ in each person, the stranger, the guest, the sick, the enemy, each other, and even the prioress. Good zeal fosters ardent and fervent love, he says. Now, since zeal and ardent love are not words that I use commonly in speech, I went to the dictionary to try to get a better understanding. And this is what I found. Enthusiastic, intense, passionate, fierce, eager, fiery, burning love. That is what Benedict wants to see in his monks. We are to make this love present, starting in the ordinary little daily practices, mutual service, kindness, respect, and patience. He calls us to bear one another's weaknesses in our day-to-day -day realities. Be patient with the one who is always late for the carpool, or the one who forgets to show up for dishes, or the sister who tells the same story over and over again at dinner. Be forgiving to the one who misunderstands you or judges you harshly or holds a grudge against you. Benedict echoes Jesus' revolutionary way of thinking and acting. Seek what is good for the other rather than pursuing your own interest. The common good has to become much more important than self-interest. Benedict also offers us a new kind of competition. The journey of love is not a race to see who gets there first, because it is not about arriving alone. We run together. Christ is leading us all together in the midst of our diversity, because together we can accomplish so much more than alone. Together we can change the world. And today, in the 21st century, we still hear prophetic voices calling us to be disciples of love. Just a few weeks ago, we laid to rest another follower of Christ, John Lewis, a man of unfailing perseverance and deep joy who stood out like a bright shining light. Like Jesus and Benedict, he was a humble person who dedicated his life to making a better place for all. I was mesmerized by the public attention and the tribute that flooded the social media for a week. In a world where the nightly news is monopolized by violence, politics, COVID-19, it was so refreshing and inspiring to see so many people come forth to honor and pay tribute to the goodness and the legacy of John Lewis. He was a man of persistence and conviction who earned the respect 
from legislators on both sides of the aisle. His life of service transcended political disagreements. John called us to be responsible. In plain speech, he said, and I quote, If you see something not right, do something. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep on doing right. Give it all you have, for you only pass this way once. John was a lover and a fighter who clung to nonviolent methods. Love was his way of being, a way of action, for like Jesus, he believed that love can conquer hate. And what about us? How far and deep does our love go? Are we committed to working and suffering for justice, for fighting against the evils of racism, sexism, violence, corruption, and poverty? In a nation where the leader flaunts an America First slogan, Benedict reminds us that we are to seek first the good of others. How will we respond to the urgent needs of others in developing countries? What are we willing to give up so that others may live? How will we respond to the present climate crisis? How will we change our energy and food consumption patterns to help our Mother Earth? How will we foster peacemaking in place of war? Love demands action. I conclude with a quote by a Franciscan sister and theologian, Elia de Leo, who states, our challenge today is to trust the power of love at the heart of life, to let ourselves be seized by love, to create and invent ways for love to evolve into a global wholeness of unity, compassion, justice, and peacemaking. Sisters and friends, with gratitude for the past and courage for the future, in the midst of a world that is stopped by a pandemic, let us seize this Kairos moment. Let us be ready and willing to run together on this journey of love. For I believe that with God, all things are possible. <laughs>